This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. In 2008, a podcast was created with one goal. To bring Bat fans around the world news related to movies, comics, video games, television, merchandise, and so much more. And now, the Batman Universe Podcast has returned. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of the TVU Podcast. I'm Dustin and joining me is BJ, Scott, and Otto. And we are here to talk about all kinds of stuff related to the Batman universe and even beyond that with the DC universe, specifically when it comes to the films. We have uh, new uh, some new entries as part of Gunwatch. Um, we have uh, an unfortunate update for the upcoming Gotham Knights TV show. And we also have our main discussion. There was some information that came out from Bleeding Cool about 5G and DC. If you don't know what that is, we'll get into that and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, but it's basically like a what if, what could have been, um, how the entire DC landscape could have changed, at least for a shorter period of time, um, prior to the events of... Uh, not necessarily prior to the events of COVID, but due to some other things that happened right around the same time. So we're going to get into that first. But first up, let's do a little quick update for Gotham Knights. Now, we haven't talked about Gotham Knights, the TV show coming to the CW in quite some time, mostly because there hasn't really been much to talk about. The last time we talked about it, there was a trailer released last July, I believe it was during San Diego Comic Con, if I remember correctly. But we talked about the trailer, we bashed it. Um, I can tell you that that episode, at least on YouTube, was one of our most watched episodes that we released last year because uh, I'm, I'm sure that we're not the only ones who are not necessarily thrilled with the idea of what this show is going to be doing and portraying the Batman universe as. But there's a new trailer. Um, it's because the show is actually coming soon. It's uh, actually going to be releasing on March 14th, the first episode on the CW, and then obviously subsequent episodes after that. The There's there's a couple of things that I want to talk about. The trailer, it's really just a lot of the exact same stuff that we've already previously seen, um, but there's a couple of other things that have happened. One, um, we know that Harvey Dent is playing a big role in the show, but it has been confirmed by some behind-the-scenes videos that have been posted uh, that he will, in fact, become Two Face at some point, will full on, you know, scarred face and everything. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I didn't see that happening, at least in the first season. Um, but then the outside of that, not related to the specifics of what's happening in the show, there's a lot of debate on whether or not this show will actually get a second season regardless because of how the the leadership within CW has changed recently. So Warner Brothers and, and Paramount or Paramount CBS, however you want to put it, they owned the CW and they sold the majority stake off to a new company, Nexstar, and that company is basically getting rid of a lot of the longtime shows. So last year we saw a lot of shows get canceled. Um, that wasn't necessarily specifically because of that, but The Flash is ending, um, and then that leaves really only two shows remaining on the CW that are that are DC-related with Superman and Lois and this new upcoming Gotham Knights. Now, based off of the cost of the shows and how well they do, I think there's going to be some discussions on whether or not they'll continue to have superhero shows or if these shows could potentially move over to you know, HBO Max if they, if they wanted to. Um, but that said, um, has your excitement level for this show changed in any way since we saw that original trailer, you know, seven months ago? Nope. I think that's the quick answer is I watched this new trailer for ahead of the podcast. It was, uh, 
like you said, the same. It just looks kind of junky and not my vibe. And I hope it finds its audience, I guess. I'm just going to ignore this one because it just kind of looks like crap. I might, I might have to at least watch the first episode just to see what it is. Um, maybe after that, I probably I'll forget about it. Like I forgot the show was even happening until the trailer popped up. Uh, the other day on Twitter, but I might just have to see the first episode. I feel like a lot of Bat fans kind of want to watch that first episode to see if it's a train wreck. So that might it might set like ratings records. Uh, it might give the wrong impression to uh studio people, but uh, my level of excitement has not changed. I mean, it's not. It's I would say not possible for it to go any lower. That's just how it is. I think, uh, you know, the teasers on, on uh, Twitter, I think there's one person who said, whoever greenlit this should be imprisoned. And then there's another person who is begging them not to air it and that they will pay money for it not to be aired. And I think that essentially sums up my feelings towards it. Um, I might watch it just for comedy purposes. I mean, that doesn't sound like (laughs) a great thing, but uh, I might watch it just to, um, live tweet how bad like hilariously bad it is uh but i obviously don't want to you know be too negative and whatever because i know that's a whole other thing that happens in you know our fandoms but uh yeah that's the only reason i would watch it i have no interest otherwise yeah it's interesting because i i I don't know who is going to be looking forward to this um obviously the cw has its own specific type of audience uh it skews very young sometimes it skews a little bit more female but I don't know who specifically is looking for this show the way it is. I also don't understand within the the minds of you know the creators behind the series why they thought it was such a good idea to have yet another show that has that another show about Batman that doesn't have Batman. I mean, they did that with Titans. They've done that with other shows. I don't understand why they think that is such a good idea. Number one, number two, I don't know that anybody's really list realistically thinking about the damage and i know we talked about this before so i don't want to harp on this i don't know that anybody's really thinking about the damage that this show could actually do to the brand that is you know the batman brand i i really don't think they're they're thinking about this and that concerns me because you know we've heard david zaslov ceo of warner brothers discovery say that batman is a very key part of their you know, it's a key cornerstone of their company and DC and all of that. And then you think about, yes, but we're still somehow green lighting this show and how in the world is this coming out? I just don't get it. Um, I'm not looking forward to it. Um, I will say for the sake of argument, we probably we we may be reviewing the episodes because they are specifically Batman episodes. Um, we'll see. Not specifically here on the podcast, but uh, on the website. So we'll see what happens with that. But I'm not looking forward to it. And really the thing that concerns me the most is that there are certain characters in this show that it's going to be their first time to like be put out there to the public. Like Stephanie Brown and Carrie Kelly. And we're not going to get another shot necessarily with these characters if it fails miserably. And then there's no reason to bring those characters up again in the near future and that's the part that concerns me but i think the other problem is that unless there is a firm idea on how to bring the bat family into you know movies or the larger picture of whatever they're trying to do with the dc universe on film or tv shows or whatever unless there's a firm plan to bring it stuff like this is just going to keep happening we're we're going to keep seeing stuff like titans and we're going to keep seeing stuff like this where it's like taking aspects of the bat family without batman and telling and being able to use these characters knowing that there is some audience there but there's also the possibility of growing those characters to a bigger audience that you can't and we've never really seen outside of dick grayson and you know barbara gordon outside of you know anything that is not you know, animated. It's just unfortunate. So I, I mean, there was there was a point. What was it? I think it was like 2018. I want to say it was. So it was after Justice League came out. They were really talking about what they were going to do with the future of the DC EU or DC films or whatever. And I remember at San Diego Comic Con, Jeff Johns was asked, you know, what's the plan for Batman? And I remember 
and I'm not sitting here saying in any way, shape, or form that I specifically want Jeff Johns linked to this, but at least at the moment, he was linked into what was going on at DC Films, and he had said, you know, we really want to figure out a way to have the Batman universe exist on its own, have it exist by itself, and be able to utilize the other characters that are so famous within the Batman universe. And I was really looking forward to whatever they were going to do, and I thought maybe something was going to happen with the Ben Affleck film that was originally going to happen, um, just because th- that seemed to be the next step of whatever they were going to do, and then obviously things changed. But I just I, I want to get away from the cheesiness of... Uh, exploiting the Bat family and getting to a point where we can we can celebrate the Bat family in a really unique and high quality way. I think I don't know with the way like the internet works and how everyone like knows everything online and like people can really like dive deep into the characters. I think they'll be okay if Harley Quinn could survive her live action debut in that Birds of Prey show. I th- I think like these these characters will be fine, you know. Like they have exposure elsewhere, and maybe they'll get another go around where they'll be portrayed better. I honestly feel like I kind of hope that this show is just a few episodes or one season and done, and then we can forget about it. We can get the Matt Reeves universe shows and move on. Birds of Prey two point oh. Well, I think yeah. uh, what, one reason why. Um... We might see these characters again in future is because the actual versions of these characters look nothing like the versions we're seeing on this show. So I don't think there's a there's a danger there for that. And I mean, they actually um, a, a good example of this is Cassandra Cain, right? In uh, Birds of Prey, where that version of Cassandra Cain is really nothing like Cassandra Cain in the comics. So there's no reason we can't get a, a, a legitimate version of, of the character. All right, so getting away from Gotham Knights, um, we're going to jump into our gun watch. We've got a couple of different things that popped up over the last couple of weeks. The first one is we've got um, James Gunn basically debunking a couple of things. The first thing that he said was um, somebody asked, was quoting the Variety article that we talked about at the very end of the gun watch last time, which said that Wonder Woman wasn't a part of plan, a part of the plan immediately with the first slate. And somebody asked, can you please debunk this? And he said, I hereby debunk it because it's not true. Um, So that means that at least to a degree, there is a plan for Wonder Woman. Whether or not that's Gal Gadot, that's a different story. Then there was a question specifically asked in relation to, can you also discuss at all the report from Variety in regards to Ezra Miller and the notion your slate is only three years worth of projects? And he specifically said, I don't know what's out there about Ezra, but our slate is eight to ten years but we will only be announcing some of it this month. So again, it's not specifically stating that anything is on or off the table at the moment. I think honestly, if the flash ends up doing really well, they may rethink what they're doing with the flash instead of like rebooting the flash. But let's also keep in mind that if, if, if the flash ends up being what we expect it to be with, you know, some sort of version of flashpoint, they can easily recast the Flash and it wouldn't make a difference. And I don't think anybody's really going to have a problem with that. Um, but specifically about his about the slate, he's saying that they're planning for 8 to 10 years. And he's saying that they're going to announce only you know the beginning part of that slate immediately here in the near future. So that's important to note too because despite the fact that he is only under contract for three years, they are making plans long term for a very long time long long period of time all right then the next thing we've got is that uh one the warner brothers discovery uh cfo has said that they are done killing content for tax write-offs they said that um we've come up we've come to great solutions and most importantly we're done with that chapter they really think that was really important to all of us um specifically we really have command and control over the business now and there were some surprises in the first months of the combination as you know but we were we put out the guidance for this year at the end of December, and I've been very, very pleased with all the operating trends over the second half of the year. Um, they said they got a lot of public noise for the content write-offs that we took, uh, but there's a lot of building that they are planning on doing going forward rather than uh, you know writing off content. So that that speaks volumes to what they're doing with not only DC and any 
current projects, but it seems like, at least for the time being, any of the projects that have yet to be completely canceled probably aren't. Um, we haven't heard any updates from Cape Crusader in a while, but I imagine we will. Um, I imagine it's going to end up being announced as like a big de- as part of a bigger deal with you know one of the bigger studios. I know that Amazon was the big one in the running uh, more recently, um, so it's 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 good to see that at least for now they're not focusing on that. Now at the same time, it was also. Uh, Otto found a uh, article that uh, was talking about how Warner Brothers Discovery is looking at selling their soundtrack library, which is about a bill is worth about a billion dollars. And I will say for that, I'm not entirely surprised by that because a lot of film companies now do sell their they do have their their soundtracks and scores licensed out to other people now. Um, I know the one that everyone talks about is Universal Music Group is huge, and that's mostly because they own so much of what's out there. They're also the ones who are constantly putting copyright claims on the tiniest snippets of music on YouTube, so they get a lot of bad press and things like that. But honestly, if Warner Brothers... Warner Brothers hasn't really been producing anything outside the film sphere when it comes to music for quite some time now obviously there's some stuff for tv shows and things like that but for the most part music is not the same thing it used to be so i'm not entirely opposed to the idea of this as long as it doesn't affect the ability for them to use it and i honestly truly believe it would be them selling the scores and basically the rights to the library but they still have the ability to use it whenever they want all right the next thing we've got There was an article that popped up at Variety uh, specifically talking about the box office bets for the year, and it listed Flash under one of the biggest risks of the year, and they said specifically it has to do with Ezra Miller's connection. But the interesting thing that came out in this was that it specifically said that studio insiders have, have seen the film and haven't been this excited about a DC film since The Dark Knight. That is very hard to believe it's very i mean i'm not sitting here saying that the flash can't be a good movie regardless of the actor who's you know in the midst of you know a huge turmoil and and drama and stuff like that however the batman was a great movie and while it didn't make as much money as the dark knight the question that i have to make is the joker aquaman both made a billion dollars um Dark Knight obviously did a, an insane amount of money, but both Joker and Dark Knight made, or uh, Joker and Aquaman made more money than the Dark Knight. So I'm curious as to where they're t- saying that they're interested in this going, because if they're talking about story perspective and not business, and let's be honest, they're talking about business. But if they're talking about story perspective and they're talking about what this means for the future of DC, this is like the tail end of what is here before we get into whatever's coming so that seems like a weird thing to be uh fixated on if it's the business side of things i mean i'm i hope it does well because obviously that that means good things for dc in the future but i have a hard time believing especially now that we're less than six months away from the release date uh we we have yet to get anything but that first trailer that was released ages ago there's been hardly any marketing it just seems odd. Now, that said, it also has been announced that Warner Brothers will be having a Super Bowl spot for the first time in over a decade, and it is expected to be The Flash. So maybe there is something to that where they really do believe this movie can be like the massive blockbuster they've been waiting for for such a long time. I, I have really bad feelings about this. I think that's a bad idea. I think that article, well, those claims are fluff. I think they're just trying to tie it to a movie people like and keep going back to. And, you know, part of the motivation might be because there's so much merch tie in that's stuff that's coming stuff. That's already out. We had costumes that they relabeled for Halloween. There was the flash Batman Christmas ornament. They were selling at target with a Michael Keaton figure that used the suit from the flash. And we know that they're having um, toys for like younger children. They just released promos of the new Batwing for the Michael Keaton era Batwing. And then McFarlane has a whole line that apparently the list is up of what's coming, but the official announcements will be made in a couple months, I believe. But I think it's honestly just, kind of like nonsense i want to use a a stronger word there but i'll refrain myself um and it kind of it pisses me off a little bit 
just because like this whole Ezra Miller thing, Warner Brothers play has been to just stick their head in the sand, kind of ignore it, and then like, you know, he's getting help or whatever, but they haven't really talked about it or done anything to really kind of garner any sort of favor. They've just kind of been ignoring it and trying to let it play out and go its course and hoping people forget about it. And I think that's a terrible play. I think the better angle that they should have done a while ago is, you know, release some kind of statements that ride the line a little bit, but kind of acknowledge what was going on and, and apologize for, you know, the problems, but also then use that to feed into all of the other people who poured their hearts and souls into this movie and try to sway attention towards the fact that this was a group effort, a large project between a lot of people to build a movie. And the fact that they're ignoring it, like, I don't know, it's been so long and so delayed and all this Edger Miller stuff just kept getting worse and worse. I don't like, I'm not going to go. And it kind of sucks because I really want to see Michael Keaton as Batman again. And my only option is to see this stupid Flash movie. But with everything going on, I don't like, I don't, it's not going to happen. Like, I'm not going to pay for it unless they do some sort of something to like make up for all of that. Like, you know, the fact that they're still trying to push ahead with this movie, you know, seemingly without acknowledging all that other crap that happened, you know, with like the weird cult thing going on or whatever, and those kids and all that stuff. Like, it's just kind of awful and kind of a shitty move. So, um, I take an article like that with a grain of salt saying that they're uh, excited since uh, the dark Knight. I mean, I remember when, um, Batman V Superman came out and there's an article saying there was a standing ovation, uh, like by studio executives after it. So, I mean, geez, as if this movie, uh, didn't have enough pressure on it. Um, compare it to probably the greatest comic book movie ever. So I can see once like the movie comes out and maybe it, people will be iffy on it. There'll be a jokes on Twitter saying like they said this was as good as the dark Knight stuff like that. So we'll see. We'll see. It's been a long time coming, but it's almost kind of like, let's rip the bandaid off. Let's get it over with. Let's see Keaton and let's move on with, uh, James Gunn. Yeah. I, uh, I agree with both of you. I think it's pure fluff. And I think it's it's them it's wishful thinking in the sense that they they want it to do so bad that they're like deluding themselves into thinking it's actually that good. And I think it's also part of it is like intentional because they think that if they put that out there then uh some people more people will see that and think, Okay, well maybe I should see this. But I think what BJ said is absolutely right. It's it's actually you're setting yourself up for failure because they're going to see it and then they're going to remember that statement and then they're going to say, this is actually trash. I can't believe that they thought it was good. And it's just going to further erode trust in, in Warner Brothers leadership. I mean, from a creative standpoint, this movie is dead. Like, as you said, Dustin, like, they're not going in this direction anymore. And <laughs> There's nothing going for it creatively. And then from a business standpoint, uh, this is anecdotal evidence just based on, like, my circle and people I see online and stuff. But, like, I don't know anyone who's, like, clamoring for this movie I don't, I don't know anyone out there who's like oh yeah that's i gotta mark that down i got i definitely want to see that or that they're waiting for it or, or something i mean from both a creative and business standpoint i don't it's kind of a dead end to me and then you have the whole ezra miller uh factor in this and you know some people want to take the position that okay like the, his personal life is personal life or their personal life is their personal life and um that's fine, whatever. Um, but and, and they'll still go see the movie. But the issue for Warner Brothers as an executive team is uh, you ca- you can't do anything if if your star is in jail, right? Like even if you want to do something after this, uh, if it by some miracle is a success and you want to build on it, and he is in jail, then there's nothing you can do about it. So uh, like I just I just don't know where they go from here, and I really don't see it working out well for them. I want to say this. I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a second. Let's say the movie comes out and the movie is amazing, regardless of the fact that Ezra Miller is in it. What if the movie is really, really good? What if, you know, they don't spend an insane amount of money marketing it and it ends up pulling in, let's say, like $750 million? And, you know, like, do you continue the idea of what they did, just recast him? Because let's be honest, it's not like character, like, 
I think that nowadays, I think recasting is is like frowned upon because Marvel has done so many movies with the same exact cast, and they've only recasted you know very s- small amounts of of actors. But I think it used to be the actors would get recast all the time. I mean, look at the original Batman movies; we had three Batman within a decade. Um, it's not like it's unheard of. So I mean, my my problem is I don't want this movie to fail because of what happened with Ezra Miller. That's my concern. I don't want this movie to fail because of that. If the movie sucks, then by all means, let it fail. But if the movie actually is really good and it doesn't do well because of the stuff that has happened with him, then Warner Brothers should have just cut the cord and and, and used that as a write-off because they probably would have got an insane amount more money for writing off that film than they would have anything else. Yeah, I think the, the only thing that that this film has going for it is what Scott was referring to is that people want to see Keaton again. There's a lot of people who have a, an attachment to that uh, 89 film, the Michael Keaton version of Batman. And, you know, they kind of want to see that again. Um, so I, we, we have to wait and see, I guess, to see how strong that sentiment is among people. It, it could carry it to 700 million, as you're saying. And then in that situation, I mean, what do you do? I guess a lot of it depends on what the plot of the actual film is. Uh, we obviously don't know that yet. Uh, but if that's the case, then I don't see any reason why they just can't recast and continue. And honestly, even uh, if Ezra Miller is not in jail, that's probably the smart thing to do anyway, just to save themselves the whole headache of having to deal with Ezra Miller and all the antics and, you know, the public relations hit that comes with it, uh, it's probably better to just recast. Yeah, I think the recast is, that's almost a guarantee whatever they do post this movie. And I think um, coming out of it, I think a lot of people, I think the big hits of the movie will obviously be Keaton. And and then a lot of people seemed excited um, for Supergirl. But I don't know what the future of that character is. I don't know. I don't think they're going to spin off into a Supergirl movie, but who knows? I have to almost wonder if the movie is successful. Like, if they really truly believe it's going to do well, their best option is that if it is some sort of Flashpoint thing where he comes back, you know, like, we're assuming it's Flashpoint because of some of the stuff we've seen in the trailer and some of the things we've heard, but... The best thing that I can imagine is that, like, just keep the characters that are in that film by themselves. You know, Keaton's not going to come back as Batman. We, you know, it's if they're going to have a new Superman, it's very unlikely they're going to be using the Supergirl. And with Ezra Miller's baggage, it doesn't make any sense for that. So what it makes sense is, is if he comes back to the present, they should just immediately wipe the slate and say, like, oh, yeah, that stuff's not, that, that was a different universe or something like that. And then, like... Maybe film a little thing at the end where it's like he's no longer even Flash. He's somebody else. Or, you know, that that uh, I should say somebody else takes over the role because he comes back and it's not that Flash. It's a different Flash or something like that. That's the only thing I could think of. All right, moving on. Um, we've got um, Dwayne Johnson. He basically uh, decided to uh, post a, a little video basically saying he's got the guts to fail as uh, everyone continues to pile on about the fact that uh, he tried to take over DC and it, it failed miserably. So he decided to go online and say, I've got the guts to fail. Um, and a lot of people don't. So good for him. Hoorah, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. As he's failing with his he's still got a billion dollars. So, yeah. I mean, I wish I could fail like that. Yeah. Hey, he's not a hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, there's nothing like uh, celebrities victimizing themselves. Yeah, exactly. All right, so next up we've got uh, reports that Matt Reeves is moving forward with uh, work on the Batman 2. He, spe- he said he's specifically working together with Matt Mattson Tomlin um, on writing the script again, and they are in the middle of that. Uh, he's also in the middle of working with the Penguin series, and he said there's a lot of things that are going to play into what happens in the Penguin series that leads into the second uh, film, which makes sense. Uh, we, we figured this was going to be the case because we heard from before that the Penguin series is going to be taking place in between the two films, not a prequel or anything like that. It immediately follows the events of the first film. So that's not a huge surprise there. Uh, one thing that I wanted to just throw out there that uh, popped up in one of the interviews, specifically at comicbook.com, was um, they asked him about Condiment King. 
Um, and they said, what's the chances of Condiment King popping up in a film in the future? And his exact words were, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I would have said probably never before, but I like the idea of uh, maybe, you know, something small popping up to reference him or something like that. Just because uh, if you don't remember during the publicity publicity cycle that they were doing for the Batman uh, Robert Pattinson was asked, what villain would you love to see in a future film? And he said, Condiment King. And it was kind of like a joke, but also he was like, it's so obscure and so weird that it would be funny to see it happen in like real life. And a lot of people grasped onto that and was like, that that would be amazing to see like a gritty version of Condiment King. And I don't really think it's going to happen to the same level Spicy that some mustard. people are. Exactly. I don't think that it's going to happen to the same same degree that some people are thinking it will. Uh, but it could be pretty amusing if there was just a guy that like Batman takes down real quick and... Uh, he he ends up like getting taken down in a diner, and the, he's trying to escape Batman by shooting some ketchup and mustard bottles at him or something. I mean, it might even just be a sign. Like I don't know. I think about like how in this film there was the convenience store was named Good Time, and you know Robert Pattinson was in this movie. So you know I made that connection right off the bat. I'm like, yeah. is that a reference? But my 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 thought on how it's going to happen is uh i'm going to borrow scott's idea of a diner and so basically there's this uh this gang or this uh thug who runs like a network and basically he's uh slipping drugs into condiments but it's cocaine or something <laughs> and batman and batman tries to shut it down and then when the fight happens in the diner he grabs the ketchup bottles and starts using them as a prop to fight so i think that's uh, that would be a funny way to do it and keep it true and also kind of keep it gritty at the same yeah. time or however long uh, these movies go on, Matt Reeves and Pattinson are just going to be asked about obscure Batman villains at every like press junket. We'll see if by the third movie they start to snap and like. If it prompts like, them to, them. if it prompts them to actually have them pop up, I'm not going to be opposed to it. Yeah. Third uh, movie, we're getting Nicholas Cage's Egghead. There you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So next up, um, there were some there were some rumors out there about how Superman was already cast, and James Gunn basically responded and said, "No one's been cast as Superman. Casting, as is almost always with the case for me, will happen after the script is finished or close to finish, and it isn't. We'll announce a few things in not too long, but the casting of Superman won't be one of them." So that's not a huge surprise, but that also confirms that the Superman film that he is writing is not finished. It's being written as we speak, but it is not currently finished uh, because he says because the script isn't finished, they can't cast because you cast after the script is done. So not much there. All right. And honestly, with that, that's all of Gunwatch. Um, We're going to jump into our main discussion, which this time around... Um, specifically, we're going to talk about a thing called 5G. And I know some people out there might not have any idea what this is. So I'm just going to give a brief history as to, far, as to exactly what 5G is. But um, there was some rumors in, I believe it was like 2019, that DC was looking to have this massive, massive um, event. And the gist of the event was that they were going to uproot the characters and create generations. So 5G is not 5G like you know with the cell phone. I mean, it, 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 I guess the name of it plays off of that. But 5G stands for five generations. And each generation is a different generation of heroes that has existed within the DC universe. So the Justice Society was one generation. You've got the current generation of like Clark Kent, Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, Bruce Wayne. That was the fourth generation, but they were actually creating the fifth generation of superheroes, which was going to be this new group of heroes that were created specifically to kind of revitalize what they were doing. Now, if you've read comics for a long period of time, uh, you might think to yourself, wow, that sounds weird. DC revitalizing their characters. Yeah, it happens a lot. Um, And it's because like they go through these like ups and downs when the new 52 happened, they were revitalizing the entire line. They were trying to do fresh stories for a lot of characters, while other characters like Batman didn't really need a fresh start. But it was kind of like lost in the shuffle as to what was going on just by telling new stories and then kind of ignoring some of the stuff that had happened in the past. Then, you know, years later, we had DCU, we had Rebirth. There's all these different things that happen. It's because comic sales eventually start to go down and they have to figure out some way of getting them to go back up. So in most cases, it's rebooting something or relaunching the series or putting a super high profile creative team on the series or something like that. 
this was kind of uprooting all of that. And the idea here was that they were going to do a lot of different changes to all of the characters, but specifically the main characters that you know and love were going to age up. And that was what was going to happen. And the the generational thing was going to basically lead into this new wave of, of heroes, which, of course, included a new Batman. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, I read comics. I know about Jace Fox as Batman. And you're right. That was kind of the idea. But there was a little. There was somebody else who was going to be playing Batman, not Jace Fox or Tim Fox. Um, so we'll get into that in a second. But the idea here was that there was a, a bunch of different events that were going to set off this like new explosion into this new universe. And what ended up happening was... Uh, Dan DiDio was let go from DC Comics, and with that, 5G kind of like fell apart. Uh, for a very long time prior to him being let go, that is what they were working on. That is what everybody was talking about, and they had a lot of different plans. And when it fell apart after he left, they used some of it for little bits and he- little things here or there. Like they had the uh, future state um stuff that came out which was kind of like setting up or utilizing some of the content that was supposed to happen with this new 5G um some of it spilled out like for example we've seen I am Batman still happen um and that was intended to be part of like the new Batman stories that were being told so they just re reworked a little bit of things here or there to like make them work within current continuity so that they could still play out at least in some way, they, the way they wanted to, without affecting the other things that were going on. So, that all being said, obviously we're in 2023 now, and 2020 was when this stuff was all going to happen, and it didn't. Uh, part of it was because Dan DiDio got let go, part of it was because COVID happened, and they're just everything changed very, very distinctly from what they wanted it to be. So, that all being said... Three years later, we've got a, a a bunch of lists uh, or a bunch of things that would have would have or could have been if 5G actually went through. Um, specifically, Rich Johnston has done a bunch of an extensive amount of uh, interviewing. I, he doesn't have, he, he of course doesn't quote his sources, but I assume he has insiders that have told him some of this stuff, um, and then some of it is just. You know what he has heard so and so say about some say so and so else say. So it's all hearsay, or some of it could be hearsay. But the the point is, some of this actually could have happened. So we're gonna go through kind of like the the bit the bullet points per se of what could have been with the Batman universe and how things could have been very different, and then just talk about what we think, if any of it, would have been interesting or. Are we really glad that this didn't happen? So the first thing was that um, the the beginning of it was that the plan was Batman was going to be done. Bruce Wayne needed to go away, and in order for that to happen, they needed something to something big to happen. So specifically, I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth with this because it sets up a lot of the other events that happened, but. Tom King mentioned that the death of Alfred was intended to be the beginning of 5G and specifically keeping him dead. That would see Bruce Wayne starting to lose his connection to humanity as regards Alfred as as he regards Alfred as his real father. And Tom King has said that this will still have huge per- percussions going forward. Uh, specifically, Alfred died during the City of Bane storyline in Batman in 2019. However, in this version of events, the funeral drove the Bat family apart rather than pulling them together. Specifically, Lucius Fox would offer support to Bruce at the expense of his son, Luke Fox. The following storyline, which would later become the Joker War, was called Batman Joker The Final Conflict, which then Batman writer James Tynion has talked about. The Joker's assault on Gotham leads Batman to decide to stop Joker once and for all, especially after having only just lost Gotham and Alfred to Bane. Batman defeats the Joker and traps him, but in the final twist, Batman lets the Joker go after the Joker whispers something in Batman's ear. It's later revealed to be a promise that if Batman lets the Joker go, then the Joker will kill Bane in revenge for the death of Pennyworth. And he is the only one who could. Uh, So yes, uh, obviously that is a huge difference on what happened. Now, at the time when Alfred died, I distinctly remember them making a big deal about it going before it happened. 
Tom King was marketing the crap out of the death of Alfred as like this huge thing. And he needed to go to the higher ups at AT AT&T to make sure that they could actually do this and all of that. And then it happened and it just kind of like was nothing. And I thought it was such a weird situation to have this character die and then not really get a focus. Sure, they had a funeral episode or issue. They had, you know, like a memorial, and they've they, he's he's. I mean, technically, he's still dead in the normal continuity, but it was very muted. And I never really understood why, but this explains why because obviously that was to lead to other events that didn't actually happen. Um, the Bat Family after this kind of came together as Tynan took over. Um, but the idea of Batman letting the Joker go so that the Joker could kill Bane, I mean, that is a very interesting and twisted idea that I don't know that Batman in a normal situation would ever do. Yeah. That would have bro- that would have broke the internet if that happens. Like Twitter would have shut down. People would have lost their mind. I don't know how I feel about it. Like I've been mulling it over. And I guess like it like I could see it being done in a way where like it makes some kind of sense for like Bruce is that broken and he's still not like directly killing anybody but you know I don't know how I would feel about it I guess like it all depends on how it was done I mean I'd be opening the, open to reading it and I you know on the surface I do like the idea of like before we knew what these bullet points were I like the idea of having different generations and like creators would tell stories you know and and the present day would be something different like i was totally up for that but yeah i i think the idea the concept of of generations is is great i mean this is what a lot of uh comic book fans including myself have been asking for a while which is like to actually let these characters progress in a meaningful way instead of just being static and stuck in time um however the way that they were planning on executing this, uh, to me at least, is it was absolutely terrible. Um, and I think this is a this is an interesting theme that's kind of repeating because we see this with the with TV all the time. Oh, we're going to give you a show with the Bat Family, but guess what? It's Batman's not in it, and it's none of the Bat Family members that you want to see, and you can't even recognize the ones that are in here. You know, to go back to our earlier discussion about Gotham Knights, um, and the frustrating thing about this particular plan was that. The exit for if they wanted if they wanted uh, Bruce Wayne to move on, the exit was right there in the story Tom King was telling. <laughs> like if they had just gone forward with that with that whole wedding storyline that they had planned, Bruce Wayne rides off into the sunset with Selina, and you know instead of Alfred's death, instead of Alfred's death uh, making him lose his humanity, it would have been nice for them to show some growth in that he's now stepping into the role as like a mature father figure to the bat family. I think that would have been a, a better story where he's now taking that mantle on for himself completely. And then you have, you know, the, he's trained them up well enough. They're old enough that they can step into the role and fill the role that he once had as a crime fighter. Uh, so, I mean, I think that to me would have been a better, uh, a better way to do things as a fan. This idea of, you know, uh, Bruce Wayne letting Joker go because he planned to kill Bane. I mean, like, uh, why why are they so determined to ruin our heroes for us? I, I don't understand. The next thing that they uh, were going to do um, that would have continued to destroy our heroes for us uh, was that there was a series called Batman Last Days and it was supposed to be an event comic series that would have followed the events of Dark, uh, Death Metal Dark Crisis um, back then before it was called just Dark Crisis and it was reworked, obviously. But uh, the idea would be that Batman is now older, he's going to be nearly 60, and he would have he, he's forced to consider retirement. And when in the process of trying to make amends for the things that he's done wrong, um, he the, the promise that the Joker was going to be able to murder Bane, he starts to kind of have to deal with that. Uh, the Joker did, in fact, murder Bane, and Bruce Wayne gets like hit with a bunch of guilt. Um, he decides to leave Gotham uh, all c- completely, and he tries to search for redemption. Um, specifically, now, something like this played out um, within the confines of the series The Joker uh, by James Tynion. Joker did go hunting for Bane. Uh, that did happen 
in the pages of that series. But if you remember correctly, the last couple of issues of that series also were late and reworked because it didn't have to do with him actually killing Bane. So there was that. Um, but then the other side of it was that Batman ended up retiring to England. That's what ends up happening. Um, he he leaves and he goes to England. Now, there was a, ser- a, a mini-series that was released, I want to say it was in 20. 20- 20 late 2020 i think is when it started it was called batman the detective and originally it was called batman dark detective or something like that i or batman dark knight or something it was a different name before it actually released and then for some reason they changed the name before it actually hit stands but that series takes place in a slightly distant not not distant but slightly in the slight future where batman is older He has retired, he has left Gotham, he moves to England, and supposedly this series is telling a portion of what could have happened in this last day's storyline where Batman retires and leaves Gotham, and this miniseries that ended up being just like kind of a out-of-continuity throwaway series ends up telling a story that could have been the future of what Batman could have been. Dan DiDio, he, uh, I feel like he's always been trying to like or totally reboot like the DC comics. Like I remember, um, or like killing people off or things like that. Like he was in Infinite Crisis, he tried to kill off Nightwing, and then later um, he got talked out of that. And then New Fifty Two, they rebooted everything younger. But I guess in a way, I've almost would have respected this a little bit because they kind of would have went all the way. They would have dove right in. Where at New 52, they kind of half in, half out, where it was a five-year timeline, but Batman already had, like, five Robins. So it would have been, like, a Robin a year, basically. So I re- would have almost respected if they went all the way in, but they yeah. didn't. So, Commit yeah. to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> I did like I did read the detective and it was fine. I enjoyed it. It's you know if you're bored and you like Tom Taylor, it's not his most amazing work, but it's definitely not his worst. Yeah, and then what ended up happening with the next Batman or what we know as uh, the Batman that is in New York now because he's no longer called the next Batman. Um, basically, what would have happened is. When Lucius Fox offered Bruce Wayne help, he uh, basically ignored his son, Luke Fox. Luke Fox, who we know as the hero who has played Batwing, not so much recently, but he has he has popped up. If I remember correctly, the last time we saw him as Batwing, within the confines of before 2020, I think he popped up a couple times as a potential love interest for Barbara Gordon in the Batgirl series um, because he was running around... Uh, Hippieville in, in Gotham City. I, I, Burnside, yeah, that's what it was. Hippieville, I forgot. Um, I like Hippieville. I yeah. think they should. They, I think I like that. Um, but I remember he showed up, and I, if I remember correctly, he had his own mini tech company or something like that. Which, I mean, it whatever. It didn't make a whole lot of sense, and I don't really remember him being Batwing, but I can't remember for sure. But all that being said. He was the one who is actually going to take the place of Batman. So after Batman leaves, Luke Fox becomes the next Batman, and he takes over the mantle of Batman as the Batman of Gotham City. Now, obviously, that didn't happen because somehow it got ended up reworking, re- reworked, and a different brother of Luke Fox that, to to be honest, had never really had any sort of role whatsoever in any of the books suddenly became the next Batman. And I don't know why that was because they still don't, it's not like there's like this huge brotherly conflict between them. Like they've shown a little bit here or there of like, uh, Tim who goes by Jace, uh, kind of like having conflict with, um, with Luke, but it's not like a big story element. Like he interacts with his sisters way more than he does his brother. So it's odd. I don't know why they chose to go the route of, you know, going with Tim Fox, Jace Fox. I don't know why they did that. That was a that's a weird thing that just happened to happen. Um, but maybe it was because they were just trying to create something fresh and new, where they could you they could mold whatever the character they wanted to without having the confines of the the continuity history that existed with with uh, Luke Fox. Is my only assumption. Um, 
obviously that still happened because we got the new the next Batman, which turned into I Am Batman, and now he's Batman in New York City. Now I will say nothing against the book itself, but I've always had a problem. No, I guess it is something against the book itself, so I shouldn't say that. But ever since this book existed, I never really understood the point of it. Um, Batman has never really addressed the existence of this Batman and somebody walking around being a Batman, especially in a city as big as New York City, you would think that Batman Bruce Wayne would be concerned with whatever it is, but he doesn't seem to be. He doesn't seem to care and it just exists in its own little world. There's a little bit of characters that pop in here and there from Gotham City, but it's very self-contained and like personally, I just don't understand the point other than they must have had John Ridley sign a contract to produce something and this is what he was going to produce and they just said okay well we're not doing 5g so just write this stuff as its own thing for the time being but i i don't hear a lot of people talking about i am batman um the reviews on the site don't get as much traffic as some of the other stuff so i don't really know what this is trying to achieve by being so disconnected yet still having the moniker of batman it's weird because it's still going, and I always forget that it's still going because the assumption would be that at some point Batman would fly in his Batwing, pick up Jace, and like toss him into Batman Inc. or something because that's what he does with all the other would be Batman. Like that's where they go, and it's just like this weird errant toy out of the toy box that's just kind of there. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you guys if there's ever been like a like a almost like a christening of Bruce Wayne christening this guy as Batman, but apparently they've never even interacted. And I like, I've read like dark crisis um, and the uh, Jace Fox is in that as Batman. And no one even says like, Hey, there's two Batman here, but it's very, it's very strange. It is almost like he's ignored, but they drop him in places, big yeah. events. But I don't know. Hey, Matt, I just don't know if anything ever came of that. So my the, the thing is the only meeting part that I can remember and I can't and I like it's hard to keep up with everything that happens in every single book. Uh, I know everything that's happening in every single book, but I don't know. I, I can't always remember everything, especially if it was like some, you know, little itty bitty piece. But during Future State, there was Batman was presumed dead and Jace Fox was the next Batman. And eventually when Bruce Wayne comes back, there's like they they kind of acknowledge that they're that you know that they both are Batman, but it's not that, that nothing really happens. And then when Future State Gotham released, which was a ongoing series, they focused again on the fact that there was multiple characters that were Batman, but there really wasn't like a fight for the true mantle of being Batman or anything like that. But that's all that happened, and that was taking place in a non, like a future that didn't actually exist or may never actually exist based off of the events of what happened. So I don't recall anything in I Am Batman that involved Bruce Wayne at all. I don't recall uh, Jace Fox showing up in any other book outside of his own books. Um, I know that he has, like like you said, BJ, popped up in some DC stuff, but it's it's very weird. Uh, I don't really understand it, and I and it's also strange because there's so many other characters that go by the wayside for these create. And I know I've harped on this before. Longtime listeners of any of our podcasts will remember that I have said this multiple times. But there are so many characters within the Batman universe that somebody comes along, they create, and they're never used ever again. And when it's a hero, it's really frustrating because you have to do a fair amount of establishing the character to be able to have someone else pick up the character and use. And there's characters that like nobody nobody has anything to do with. Like Duke Thomas hasn't been used in ages. He was he was regulated to the outsiders and the outsiders was it supposed to have a series never ended up happening. Maybe it will someday, but they have he hasn't been around you've got other characters like harper row which had a purpose for a certain amount of time and they just kind of like retired her because she wasn't going to pop up you've got Azrael, who's got a series sort of Azrael running around right now but he has nothing to do with any of the mainstream books it's odd because it's like there's a core group of the bat family that at least some people somebody within dc is saying these are the characters that we want to use 
if it's not one of these characters, they they can exist, but they've got to exist outside of the realm of what's going on in the in these main titles. It's weird too how I don't want to say like lack of creativity, but like there's two Batman, there's two Flashes, there's two Superman, there's two Robins, there's like I don't know, like Green Lantern's fine because they're space cops, but it is weird how it's like two of all these major heroes that it can be kind of confusing, and one of them is always going to get left to the wayside. Yeah, so I haven't um, I haven't read the the new I Am Batman series yet, uh, but. To me, what sounds really weird is this idea. Okay, so if if there if Bruce Wayne is gone, and there's supposed to be a new Batman to replace him, why is it a character who we have barely seen at all in the last like five to ten years? That's that's what I can't understand. And I'm gonna go to a place where I think we're all kind of not saying right now, and I think it's because you know DC wants to diversify their lineup of characters, which is fine. I mean, I have. I mean, I have no problem. I'm obviously, you know, I have no problem with that. But what I think this approach does is it does a disservice to those characters because there is a way to set it up within the comics. Batman Inc. exists. You could have, you could set up uh, Jace Fox as Batman in another massive American city. There's so many out there to pick from. Uh, And then you could sort of connect him to the main Batman mythos that way versus this where you're just kind of like putting him right at the front of the line. But then it's, it's kind of messed up because the original plan is no longer going forward. And then the the Bruce Wayne is back to be the real Batman, quote unquote, real Batman. And then he's kind of in no man's land. And this is what happens with so many of their characters like Duke Thomas, who I actually didn't have a problem with. And I thought it was actually a, a, a good addition. He, we haven't seen him in forever. There was that, that um, I think it was Brandon Thomas who did that uh, Batman and Signal series. I, I actually reviewed that one. And it was promising this, like, okay, he has these powers and we're going to go somewhere new with this character. He's going to be the, the daytime partner of Batman. He's going to fight crime in, during the day. And that just never materialized. And then, so these characters fall by the wayside. So it's a disservice to, you know, their stated goal of in, in diversifying their lineup. And then in addition to that, it opens them up to criticism from other fans who are like, oh, you're only pushing these characters because of their, you know, uh, identity, etc. And so all altogether, that just makes a really bad environment uh, on all sides. And it's uh, I just think it's very unfortunate. Yeah, it was uh, Tony Patrick, if I remember correctly, who did the Signal series. Brandon Thomas was the one who did who picked up Signal um, in the confines of the Outsiders and had Signal being like the Bat family member who was part of the Outsiders. Um, but to okay, so to wrap up some of the other things, eventually there would have been some sort of conflict between Damian Wayne and Luke Fox as Luke Fox is the Batman. Damian Wayne returns to Gotham and there's, there was a problem. Um, There was a series that was called Batman versus Robin, which would have been Damian Wayne versus Luke Fox. And obviously we got something very different. That is Batman versus Robin right now. And has to do with the Lazarus pits and things like that. Um, Tamara Fox, uh, she would have been the new Robin, that's not a huge surprise because if you have been reading I Am Batman, Tam Fox has become the Robin of Jace Fox's Batman in New York City. So that's not a huge surprise there. And then finally, what it specifically said was in 2023, there would have been a book published that was called The Hunt for Batman. And it takes place after Luke Fox has happened. Uh, he's been Batman. Joker returns to basically face off against Luke Fox as Batman because he knows this isn't the same Batman. And he basically reveals that Bruce Wayne is Batman and that he let that Bruce Wayne let Joker go so that he could kill Bane. So there is a hunt for Batman because of that revelation. Um, to wrap up the whole 5G thing, there was what they call, well, what what uh, Bleeding Cool has referenced as a red button, where if this was successful, they could continue telling stories. If it wasn't, there was something built into the entire story that would allow them to basically hit a red button and get rid of everything that they did over five years. So the plan was to do this for five years, 
if it was successful and people were receptive to these new characters, then they would continue doing it. If not, they would hit this red button and be able to reset everything that happened during this 5G storyline that was happening. Now, the problem that I have with any sort of red button or being able to reset something is that you either have to go all in or you can't. Because what ends up happening is you have stuff like the New 52 where you get certain characters who end up having a lot of success and you have other characters who don't have a lot of success. And you can't concentrate on everything being successful nonstop all the time. It just it doesn't work. It just, it never works. You have the New 52. At the beginning of the New 52, all the books were selling really well. And then as you get into like six months in, some of the books were immediately not doing well. And nobody was caring about some of them. And I, it was less than a year before some of them were canceled. So my problem is that the idea of like having something built into the story to allow you to basically re- get back to the way things were after five years, it kind of like spits in the face of the fans who are supporting you for those five years who are saying, okay, let's let's see how this works out. Let's see how things go. And it just ends up making it so that there's no trust in what you're doing again because you have to endure these things for five years. And sure, things might get back to the way you like them. But what happens if there was something you like and they reset it and then they're picking and choosing what to reset and what not to reset? You just end up having super convoluted situations within the continuity. I don't understand why, you know, DC has been consistently, like, confining themselves to reshuffling the universe with another crisis or whatever. Why they don't just, like, take a page out of Marvel, something Marvel's done a couple times, and, like, create their version of, like, the ultimate line or whatever. And it's like, you can tell these stories there, they don't have an impact on the main book, and you could totally rework bruce wayne from the ground up you can make him a totally different bruce wayne if you want to diversify it like that's your in and if it's successful like the ultimate line was for a while it went for a long time you know you could do that and then fold in what you want or you know whatever it's just it's your playground to be free without like upsetting people who are buying batman books who you know will have a hard time accepting these changes yeah it's an odd choice to go down the route of constantly trying to like do something different. You have multiple Earths. Why not just use one of the Earths as a playground, like you said, to create new stories with new characters instead of forcing something to work? If it doesn't work, you just leave the Earth. You don't have to focus on it anymore. I mean, theoretically, this is what you know those Earth One series and what Black Label is supposed to be doing is supposed to be allowing for you know uh writers to tell their story in different ways and i think the other thing uh too is just to add on to the batman ink point is like to make it kind of like you can expand a bit on earth like earth is a big place you can you can have uh characters in different cities i think that makes perfect sense all right so with that that is going to wrap up our discussion um there we'll have a link to Bleeding Cool's 5G, uh, what they call the 5G files, uh, because there's a bunch of other stuff related to a lot of the other characters that aren't necessarily Batman. We obviously focused on the characters within the Batman universe, but there are other things related to Superman and some of the other characters. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Uh, be sure to check out our website for all kinds of news related to merchandise, video games, comics. Um, television, everything else related to the Bat fandom. Uh, We have podcasts, original content, editorials, reviews, all kinds of stuff, so be sure to check that out. You can follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, We're on Discord, YouTube, um, Instagram. Uh, You can follow us uh, all of those and find our links over at the top of the page over on the website. You can send us an email at tbu at thebatmanuniverse.net. I will say, just as a final thing... um, we know that there's a lot of people listening to the show. We have, on average, between 500 to 1,000 people listening to each episode. Uh, but we don't hear from you guys, so we'd really appreciate it if you guys could uh, let us know that you're listening. Um, let us know what you'd like to hear us talk about in the future. Um, one of the reasons we didn't have an episode last week outside of scheduling issues was just because we didn't have an immediate topic that we could discuss um, without just 
coming up with something on the fly. Um, so if you guys have discussions that you'd like us to talk about, be sure to let us know. Um, next week, Scott, you've got a pretty cool interview that you've got uh, that's coming next week. Yes, um, I am interviewing the writer from Batman Wayne Family Adventures over on Webtoon. It was uh, a great time, very energetic, very fun. So I'm excited for that to hit. And CRC Payne is very excited about it, too. She's such a fun person to talk to. All right, so you guys can look forward to that. That'll be here on the TBU podcast. Um, In addition to that, uh, you can find these episodes over on YouTube as well if you'd rather listen to them over there. Uh, But we're also on all podcast platforms. So with all that being said, uh, for BJ, Scott, Otto, and myself, thank you so much for listening to this episode, and we'll see you guys next time.